Hey guys, Nick here. I just want to give a quick little warning that this video will include major spoilers to the story of Resident Evil 7, so I do highly recommend you go and play the game first before watching the video to avoid any and all spoilers. Thank you. Enjoy the video. Oh, fuck. Fuck. Look, I know it's been over five years since the release of Resident Evil 7, but this game still finds a way to send shivers up my spine the second I step foot into that old, decrepit Louisiana home. Honestly, now that I think about it, during my return to RE7, it made my skin crawl more than any survival horror game has in recent memory. Everything from the perfectly executed lighting effects to the subtle yet foreboding ambient noises that add to the already incredibly eerie atmosphere. Capcom simply outdid themselves with creating that same uneasy feeling within their players as we all felt way back in the original Resident Evil 1 and 2 days. Right from the start of the game, we see our first look at the new RE engine, allowing the developers to capture hyper-realistic textures with full body motion and face capture of real-life actors to give a more personal and realistic experience to the story. After a short video of Mia cryptically telling her husband to stay away for whatever wrongdoing she has committed, we get a lengthy exposition dump from our main protagonist, Ethan, and some unnamed dude on the other end of the line that we literally never hear from again. They tell the player that Ethan got a message from Mia saying to come save her. After the cutscene ends, we get our first look into this new first-person perspective by being able to look around as our car comes to a complete stop. Now, in case you didn't know, Resident Evil has always been infamous for its interesting choices in control and player viewpoint throughout the history of the series. The first few entries included horribly slow tank controls with fixed camera angles to not only make the experience more tense and claustrophobic for the player, but also because of the limitation of the technology at the time. So as home gaming consoles advanced, Resident Evil switched to an over-the-shoulder third-person view to really take advantage of this new technology and just to switch up the aging formula at the risk of possibly losing longtime fans of the series. Thankfully, their gamble paid off with the release of their highest selling game of all time, Resident Evil 4. I feel that Resident Evil 4 was successful because even with this new third person view, they stayed true to their roots with bringing back the slow paced tank controls in order to keep that sense of tension and survival horror aesthetic that RE was famous for. They would go on to keep this third person view for the next three games, and that's excluding all the spin offs from the main series. And this is where Resident Evil 7 comes in, which completely turned Resident Evil fans on their heads by introducing a first-person view for the very first time in the series. Not only that, but Ethan as a playable character feels much quicker with his movements and reactions compared to previous games. Lastly, the tank controls of the past have been replaced with more realistic first-person shooter controls, including moving while aiming, reloading while running, and a much more realistic aiming system that involves weapon sway that Thankfully, you can reduce with miracle steroids that you require as you progress through the game. I think the first person view within survival horror games can actually be more horrifying in certain situations because not having the ability to peek around corners like you could with a third person view and not knowing if someone is literally right behind you breathing down your neck adds an extra level of anxiety to the player that you wouldn't normally achieve with a third person perspective. Another benefit to RE7 is that Ethan doesn't feel like an unstoppable military trained soldier that can suplex enemies and reload a gun in 0.3 milliseconds. He also can't punch boulders. Oh my God. But I actually like this change that Capcom decided to go with because it makes Ethan feel more believable as a character and lets you fit into his shoes a little bit easier throughout the journey compared to previous entries. I know some people have complained that he can be a bit annoying with his dialogue and there are times where I do feel maybe making him a silent protagonist might have been more fitting, but overall, I feel giving Ethan a voice and making him a real character fits better in the RE universe and makes you care more about him as a person. Plus, even though not every one-liner he says lands, some of them sent my sides into orbit. That's special. <laughs> anyway, as you slowly make your way through the dense forest, taking in the beautiful environmental details, thanks to that power of the new RE engine, you eventually come across the haunting, yet strangely beautiful site of the Baker family estate. As you turn around, you notice an abandoned van right outside the gate with a script to an unreleased television show named Sewer Gators. When you turn it around, you see a message saying, join us, written in red ink, or possibly blood on the back which is totally not weird at all. 
So like a sane person, you decide to press on, where you see a nice old man taking a lonely stroll through the woods, who seemingly vanishes the second you turn the corner. Then you even come across a group of cute birds. And whatever the fuck that is. So let's just squeeze under that real quick. There we go. And now we made it to the nice little house in the woods that has your wife's purse and belongings sitting out front in a bonfire. Well, this is totally normal and not at all like a place where our wife clearly got murdered, and we are definitely next in line to probably get our limbs chopped off one by one as the serial killer laughs in our face while we slowly fade into the afterlife. Or maybe I'm just being paranoid. And these are just some nice backwoods rednecks who have just given your wife a place to stay until you come to pick her up. Yep, I'm definitely gonna die here. But screw it, you have a wife to save. So you put on a fresh pair of underwear and you push forward in the seemingly abandoned house. Nice. So at this point, we have come to the conclusion that this place has long been abandoned and there's no way that Mia could even be here. Just when you're about to give up and leave, you come across this old VHS tape and your curiosity gets the best of you. Conveniently, there's a VCR with a working television in the living room, so you pop in the tape to see what secrets it may hold. As the tape loads up into the first scene, you realize that you now have taken control of the person behind the camera and you're literally reliving this recorded memory. These VHS tapes that you find throughout the story of Resident Evil 7 are some of my favorite parts of the game because you don't have any weapons or abilities to really defend yourself from the danger. Except for in the last one, but we'll get to that later. It sort of reminds me of the Outlast series and how you are faced with an enemy who can clearly kill you, but all you can do is run and hide in order to survive. This type of hide and seek horror really works great in short bursts, so placing these VHS tapes periodically throughout the story was a wonderfully stylistic choice by Capcom. But coming back to the first tape, you realize that you're playing as one of the three characters in that television show, Sewer Gators, who were the owners of that abandoned van outside the front gate. As the three make their way through the house, you may notice that the house actually doesn't look much different compared to what you just witnessed. This tells you that that VHS might not be as old as you once thought, so your anxiety begins to rise. As the tape goes on, Andre goes missing, and it's up to you and the host of the show to go find him. After some noises can be heard coming from the living room, you get inside and you don't find any signs of Andre. So you search around until the host comes across a secret lever underneath the fireplace that opens up a hidden passageway in the wall. You both nervously make your way through the doorway and down the ladder to find what looks like Andre standing with his back to you. But as you reach out to see if he's okay, your worst nightmare comes to life. Well, that was lovely. We now know about the hidden passageway, so we just gotta open it up and take a peek down below, right? Once you get down to the basement, you thankfully don't run into any dead bodies or serial killers, but you are forced to swim through some nasty sewer water. Sorry, I lied about the dead bodies. When we round the corner, we do see a dim light coming from within that looks like a prison cell. We slowly approach it to see a woman asleep with her back to us. Could this be Mia? The door is chained shut, but thankfully there's a pair of bolt cutters conveniently four feet from the door. Once inside, we approach the woman to find out it is indeed your wife. Mia, oh, thank God I found you. It's me, it's Ethan. Ethan? Ethan? Are you all right? You shouldn't be here. What do you mean? You contacted me. No, no, I wouldn't. Did I? Did anyone see you? Did he see you? He? Who else is here? What the hell's going on? Daddy's coming. We need to go. Oh. Daddy? We need to go now! However, something seems a bit off about her. Being that this was Capcom's first title running on this new engine, they of course ran into some hiccups along the way, including some very uncanny valley hair effects, and facial features. Mia's hair kind of has a mind of its own and it can look pretty weird at times, especially during cutscenes. It's sometimes bad enough to even take you out of the scene entirely, which is a huge shame. Thankfully, they have only gotten better with this as the games have progressed such as in the RE2 remake and the newest release of RE Village. 
But as you follow her through the basement, you try to get some answers from her about what's going on or how she even ended up here. Mia, we have to talk. That message you sent me. Not me. That wasn't me. But you did. I didn't. Okay, fine. Just tell me what's going on. I'm telling you everything that I know. We have to go this way. Hmm. Okay, then. Your suspicions about her don't last long before she seemingly gets taken away by an unseen force, leaving you all alone once again in this cursed basement. But once you gather up the courage to make your way upstairs, you find some interesting liquid in the bathroom that could possibly be used for first aid to treat wounds. That doesn't lead me to believe we are about to sustain any injuries or anything. Nope, not at all. Then you hear some very obnoxious knocking coming from the stairway you just came from. So you slowly make your way over to the door and the knocking surprisingly stops. Stupidly, you open the door, but nobody's on the other side. Then you start hearing some heavy breathing coming from the bottom of the stairs. I am not kidding when I tell you that this was the most I have ever physically cringed while playing a video game. The sheer thought of grabbing the blade with the palm of your hand just sends my anxiety into overdrive. Thankfully you survive and Mia did you a favor by knocking herself out, so maybe you can pick her up and get out of here before she wakes up. Well, you heard her. Battle's on. <laughs> so, you just killed your wife. What do you think Ethan should do next? A. Call the police and get medical attention right away to hopefully save her? B. Lay down and cry next to her during her final moments of life? Or C. Immediately forget about her and start looting the room for goodies? Now, because Ethan's an absolute chad, he chooses option C and begins to loot while... Hmm. Who could be calling? I guess we have nothing else to lose, so let's go find out. You really shouldn't have come here. Who's this? And what the fuck is going on? My name's Zoe. There should be a way out through the attic. Attic? Go there. Now. Interesting, but that's not my main focus right now. I really should try and get Mia's body out of here. Oh. Yeah, she's gone. That's great. So she's alive? Or was she taken by somebody else? I better get out of here and get some real help. Now, 
What the fuck? Yeah, your wife just cut off your hand and you're walking around with a bleeding stump now. Somehow we aren't bleeding to death or passing out from the pain, but we have no time to think about that. This bitch is going down. Okay, fine. After an intense fight with Mia, she finally, actually dies, with a gut-wrenching final line. Now the one and only issue I have with this entire opening scene is that I know we are supposed to feel bad here because we just killed our own wife and all, but to be honest, I really don't care. To be fair, they really didn't give us much to care about when it comes to Mia as a person, and in order for this to impact us at an emotional capacity. Either way, as soon as we start to get the hell out of there, we get greeted by Daddy himself. Welcome to the family, son. Fatality. We now wait to the famous dinner scene. Where? Where am I? What the hell? Rise and shine, sleepyhead. It's time for supper. Who, who are all you people? Where's Mia? <laughs> It's good. Dumb some bitch wasn't no good if it hit him. His boy's got to eat. He got to have his supper. Come here, boy. Oh man, I don't know what to do. Uh, hey Grandma, can you help me out here? Oh, she's useless. Let me just try to... Oh. Well, that was easy. We better find a way out of this godforsaken house before Dad. This entire sequence of trying to hide from Jack Baker while looking for a way out is one of the most intense parts of the entire game. Now think back to when I talked about how the VHS tapes work and how you don't really have any way of defending yourself so all you can really do is run and hide from the bad guy trying to kill you. This is essentially this entire section but turn up to 11 because you're not playing as a random character in a memory. You're playing as Ethan. You want to survive and you want to get the hell out of there alive. So the stakes are much higher and with how claustrophobic this entire area is it sends your blood pressure into overdrive with every turn you make. You could pop around a corner and be face to face with Jack, who is ready to tear you apart within seconds. Get cornered in a room by him? Well, there goes your leg. Getting chased down the hallway? Good luck, because he's twice as quick as you. He will grab your face and turn you around in order to see the fear in your eyes before he decapitates you. If you use your blocks effectively and somehow find a way to avoid his swings, you can grab the cellar key and make a break for the locked hatch in the back room. Once you get through, he thankfully decides to leave you there because he knows it won't be the last time you see his face around here. 
the end of the tunnel, you come up to what is essentially your first ever save room. Instantly, you let out a sigh of relief as you see the save tape recorder and the famous storage crate so you can store unneeded items to free up your pocket inventory and grab them for later if needed. My only issue with the save rooms in RE7 is a lack of calming save room music that Resident Evil is known for. Every RE title in the past has always had a very classic save room score that is sorely missing here. I guess it is better than no save room, though, am I right? You soon receive another call from Zoe who tells you about this watch on your wrist called a Codex. It's basically a fancy way to not have a cluttered HUD system in the game, and it'll tell you your current amount of health remaining. And she also tells you to find a way into the main part of the house by going through that giant locked door at the end of the hallway. After the call, you hear a pounding on the window, which actually turns out to be a real officer. Maybe he can actually help us. There are crazy people in this house trying to fucking kill me. <laughs> well, all right, let me tell you this. You don't exactly seem like you're playing with a full deck yourself, all right? Are you kidding me? Look, like I said, we've had several missing persons called. And I can't rule out that an outsider like yourself may not be involved. All right, I'll tell you whatever you want. All right, now that's more like it. Now, meet me in the garage. We'll talk there. Hey, wait. You gotta give me your gun. <laughs> you must have lost your mind. Look, officer. Uh, deputy. Right, deputy. Now, do you want to see my name in the obituaries? Or do you want to be a hero and save my life? A fucking pocket knife? Bruh. That's great. The cop's dead, and now you get to fight Jack again. Only this time, you actually find a weapon to defend yourself with. A car. So you grab the keys and turn on the ignition? Only for Jack to yank you out of your car and steal it as if this is GTA and you're just a random NPC. While you narrowly avoid him ramming you with the car, you begin to take notice of the damage he's causing to his own vehicle. And eventually, the car breaks down and lights on fire. And explodes. Oh, thank God, he's dead. He's actually dead. Now, just to get on this ladder and... Do I have your attention, boy? You're about to see someone. Oh, fuck! Hmm. All right. Oh, gross. Time to get out of here for real. I'm sure this will come in handy. <laughs> Told you. Walking to the main hall of the estate brings floods of RE1 memories of being in the Spencer Mansion for the first time. Even the music perfectly captivates a sense of wonder and uneasiness that Resident Evil has perfected over the years. After looking around the place and gathering yourself, you get another call from Zoe who tells you to find three keys in order to get out of the house. From this point on, it's pretty much classic Resident Evil. Loot the house while looking for ammo, items, read articles and notes for exposition to the backstory, and lastly to find keys in order to place them in correct slots or inside locked doors to unlock new areas. I absolutely love the layout of the main house and it's probably my favorite area in the entire game, apart from the opening sequence with Mia. Whenever areas in Resident Evil games include lots of exploration, puzzle solving, and searching for specific keys to unlock new areas, all the while worrying what might be lurking around the corner, I'll be in. But I am saddened to say that the main house is pretty much the only area in the entire game that feels like classic Resident Evil. Once you find the three keys and make your way into the yard, the rest of the game feels pretty linear. It's more combat focused, which is a major shame for a game that had such a strong and promising start. But we still have a bit to go before we reach the yard. First, we have to find the three keys as Zoe mentioned before. The first key is quite simple to find, just inside the grandfather clock in the dinner scene room. The second is found upstairs inside a book in the sports room. And alongside that, you'll actually find another VHS tape that essentially follows Mia trying to hide from Marguerite in the boathouse. This is probably one of the weaker VHS tapes because the stealth mechanics are kind of wonky and it's a very slow crawl to reach the end of the video that doesn't really give you any information anyway. So in my opinion, even if you skip this one entirely, you will not be missing much. 
Next, we have to find something to place in front of the projector in the main hall. This can be found in the upstairs bathtub, but as soon as we try to leave, look who we get a surprise visit from. Now I'll be honest, my first playthrough, why I remember this jump scare got me so bad because I truly could not believe Jack was still alive after everything that happened prior. You also soon realize that you can put as many bolts into him as you like, but it'll only slow him down long enough for you to run and hide. He can't actually kill him. Capcom clearly took inspiration from Jack when constructing Mr. X in the popular RE2 remake that became such an iconic villain for a good reason. Once you get away from Jack and get downstairs, you use the puzzle piece with the projector. You get this really cool puzzle where you need to line up the shadow in the right spot to unlock the door, which I thought was pretty neat when I first played it. However, like the enemy types in this game, which I will, I will, I promise, elaborate on later, they do overuse this puzzle about three more times throughout the story to the point that it's not really a puzzle anymore. It's just something that slows down your progress. But moving on, after solving the puzzle, we enter a dark room filled with what looks like tar. Taking a few steps forward, this nasty tar-like creature rips itself from the wall and starts walking towards you. I'll admit that the first time I encountered the mold enemy, I almost pissed myself and shut the game off. Their design is pretty basic when you pick it apart, but it's also quite disturbing. They clearly took inspiration from my all-time favorite creature in any Resident Evil title, the Regenerators from RE4. With their one color palette, long lanky arms, and a mouth full of razor sharp teeth that opens up wide enough to devour your entire head in one bite, it's truly the stuff of nightmares. When it's the first time seeing them. Yes, I know this complaint about Resident Evil 7 has been beaten to death by any other reviewer out there, but I have to elaborate on it a bit and give you guys my personal take on the subject. The enemy variety throughout the entire game is lackluster to say the least. I think they came up with one really decent character design for an enemy type, they just sort of ran with it. Sadly because of this, the mold monsters wear out their welcome insanely quickly. I'm not even kidding that throughout the entire story, you will encounter a total of four enemy types, and that's not counting boss battles by the way. But yes. You heard me right, four enemy types. I have no idea what they were thinking with only including a total of four different enemy variations that you will have to fight throughout your entire eight to 10 hour journey. That is of course, if it's your first playthrough. It's insane to me that nobody thought that was a bad idea or that maybe they should have gone back to the drawing board to come up with at least maybe four more enemy types to spice it up a bit. But no, all we got was four. The funny thing is, you don't even see all four types within the main house area. You only get the first two types, the standard molded and then the crawlers. Then about two hours later, you run into the flying bugs that are controlled by Marguerite. And then lastly, you fight a fat molded when trying to get to Lucas about six hours into the game. Oh, also I'm not even joking about calling them fat. That's literally what the official RE wiki calls these guys, the fat molded. But that's it. That's literally all the enemy types in the entire game. I wish I was joking or exaggerating, but no. It kind of seems that Capcom put all their time and energy into the first two hours of the game and into the boss fights, but then they kind of sent the game over to some offshore team to finish the rest of it. I have no idea if that's actually the case, but man, it's such a shame how boring the actual combat becomes halfway through when all you fight is the same recycled enemies over and over. <sighs> But yeah, coming back off my rant, I will say when you first enter the, into the basement, you encounter most of the molded there, but it's a very well done section, including clever uses of jump scares and very claustrophobic level design to keep you on your toes. As you progress through the game, depending on which difficulty you play on, and I play it on normal, you will notice that enemies don't drop ammo or anything when you defeat them. So sometimes just running around them is actually a useful tactic to get to the next area. But you will find ammo so often scattered around the map that you barely need to ever worry about ammo management. I do understand that when RE4 came out, and especially when Capcom moved on to RE5 and 6, the entire survival horror aspect of the game took a major backseat to the action and combat because those looked better in trailers and helped sell more copies. But I would have liked to see a little more love given to the survival horror elements of RE7 when it came to this new first person take on the series. Again, with such a strong opening survival horror experience, 
I would have expected more elements to follow, such as maybe more ammo scarcity to keep you more on your toes so that you're forced to use ammo sparingly, and of course, proper inventory management. I will say that with the inventory management, it's actually quite decent, and they brought back a lot of the classic designs of RE1 and 2 with the original single space inventory, but this time around, Ethan is given 11 spaces right off the rip to store items, and you can find extra storage spaces as you progress with finding backpacks. But everything you pick up from health items to crafting items, they all take up slots. And some will even take up two slots depending on their size. So you actually have to think about what you want to keep on your person before leaving a save room, which I thoroughly enjoy. I know I talked about the lack of enemy designs, but I will say that I was pleasantly surprised with the amount of weapons found within RE7. When traversing through the game, you can find two different knives, an axe, three different handguns, two different shotguns, a flamethrower, a grenade launcher, a P-19 machine gun, remote bombs, and even a 44 Magnum. Oh, and a chainsaw that you get to use for the final Jack boss fight. Now, not all of these weapons can be found just by looting around the world. Some of them you have to technically buy with ancient coins that you only get by finding them around the house as you explore. So, the more you loot, the more things you can end up buying once you reach Zoe's trailer in the yard. And other weapons will be found in broken states in which you can find a repair kit hidden throughout the house that once you use that will allow you to use the broken weapons. I really like these variations of acquiring new weapons because it gives the player variety and a reason to replay the game in order to find every gun possible to see what it's like to fight a certain enemy or boss with said weapon. Talking about boss battles, the next fight is with Jack, again. But this time, he's stronger than ever and wants to duel you with a chainsaw, because why not? So yeah, this fight is pretty awesome, and it's even fun to kick body bags into him to make him shut up. Oh boy, now look what you've done, motherfucker. Once you're able to cut him up from the inside out with a chainsaw three times, he finally explodes. And dies. Oh. Uh, maybe not? Oh, okay, yeah, he's definitely dead now. I promise. He He's dead. Do me a favor and stay dead. After the fight, you sadly break your chainsaw trying to escape the battle arena, so... Rest in peace, chainsaw. How could this happen to me? Now you race up to the door and place the third and final key inside in order to finally access the yard and Zoe's trailer. Inside her trailer, you find another save room with a few goodies and the upgrades locked inside bird cages that you can be unlocked with ancient coins, as I stated before. These upgrades range from extra overall health to lessen your weapon sway or even brand new weapons. Once again, the phone rings and Zoe tells you that you need to get past her mother in order to find an antidote for this infection that Mia and the Baker family have. So you set out to the boathouse, which essentially is a pretty linear little side house compared to the main house. The only real obstacle here is these stupid hives of bugs that will drain you of all your ammunition just to get around them. Because if you don't, they can kill you within seconds of passing them. For me anyway, they were instantly more of an annoyance than a fun new enemy type to fight compared to the already boring mold. But once you find your way around the boathouse, you will find your first inventory upgrade backpack and a pretty sweet flamethrower. The flamethrower makes it easier to deal with the bugs, but they're still insanely annoying. Once you get the key across the water, you can finally access the upstairs to get the antidote from Zoe. I told you to stay out of here! That was easy. Now let's get the antidote. Hmm. Looks like we need something to go with it. And too bad this locked door conveniently needs Marguerite's specific lamp to unlock it. Guess I'll crawl back down there and get it from her totally lifeless body. That's just wonderful. Time to grab the flamethrower and go burn her. To be honest, this is probably my favorite boss fight in the entire game because you not only get a pretty large area to fight in with lots of verticality, but because Marguerite is downright horrifying. Don't you worry, no! 
Not only is she disgusting, but the body horror inspiration of her design is incredibly well done. She isn't easy either. You need to be on your toes and constantly searching for more ammo to use in her around the greenhouse because she is the definition of a bullet sponge. But eventually you will defeat her and let out a huge sigh of relief as you watch her lifeless body crumble to the ground. So let's grab that lantern and get back to the boathouse to grab the antidote. And once we race back and open the locked door, we are greeted to probably the most psychologically terrifying area in the entire game. It's dark, there's no ambient music, and you will hear random loud noises that tell you you are clearly not alone. In a little kid's room. The perfect combination of nope. As you slowly progress through the rooms, you eventually come across one that seems more like a padded prison room than a typical child's room. In the back, you will find a hidden door that holds a nasty, decaying corpse. So, you rip its arm off. Because why not? But then when you turn around, you see you're definitely not alone here. Sadly, you don't have a choice, so you chase after the child only to be greeted with more molded. Once you've escaped that hellish room, you get another call from Zoe telling you to meet at her trailer to create the antidote. But sadly, as you arrive at the trailer, she's not there. And then you get a call from Lucas. Now where the hell are you? You know, never mind. We only need the head, and you've got it. This is gonna help me and me, right? Hey, buddy! I thought you should know. I decided that Zoe needed a timeout. She and Mia are here with me. And they're keeping each other company. Just let them both go! What do you need them for? Nah, uh, 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 that's family business, Ethan, and not your concern, understand? Now, look in the fridge. I'm not sure what I was expecting, but that was far from it. Well, now we have to go see what's in the dissection room. After fighting off more of the molded and actually running into the crawler mold for the first time, we arrived at the dissection room and it looks like Lucas wants us to... Uh, oh, oh, are... Really? Yep, we're doing it. Oh god. I'm so sorry, Ethan. Oh, gross. But, cool, we got the final snake key. And now we need two key cards. Great. So from this point, you go around the main house using the new snake key to unlock all the previously locked doors until you find Grandma's room. Once you loot all her belongings and solve the clock puzzle, you find a secret entrance beneath her bed that leads you to the nastiest cellar you'll probably ever see. But look, a key card. Convenient. Now, once you've gathered both key cards, you come across my favorite VHS tape in the entire game. It's labeled, Happy Birthday. This tape puts you back in the shoes of Clancy, the cameraman from the very first VHS tape you viewed back in the prologue, and for some reason, he was captured instead of being killed right on the spot like the other two. Lucas locks you in this puzzle room that is ripped straight out of Saw. From this point, you aren't given any instructions on what to do. You just have to roam around this dark collection of rooms and search this next clue to reach the final goal of essentially lighting the birthday cake in the hopes of escaping. Clancy gets put through seven layers of hell by getting his hands covered in literal shit, having his arms sliced open, <laughs> stomach stabbed, <laughs> and eventually even burned alive when you realize that even if you beat the puzzle, fair and square, Lucas will never let you run freely. So after that horrifying tape ends, the next move is to use those key cards on the locked door outside Zoe's trailer. 
Once the door is open, you make your way up the stairs and you're greeted with some distant EDM music, black lights, and an artistically painted Let's Party message to put you instantly on edge. As you walk inside, all you see is a giant tube TV that once you turn it on, shows Lucas taunting Ethan with the serum ingredients and saying that if we want it, we have to play by his rules in order to get it. This entire area had some really interesting ideas, but I feel the execution was a bit lackluster. It just feels way too linear with way too many booby traps that just end up pissing you off more than actually making you feel bad for making a simple mistake. Loot crates are booby trapped, trip wires are literally everywhere, and mold enemies will spawn seemingly out of nowhere to hurt you from behind constantly. It's all pretty underwhelming until you come into this barn area that's clear as day setting you up for an epic boss fight. There's countless loot boxes around that aren't booby trapped and actually give you useful items, tons of healing supplies sprinkled around, and of course tons of spaces to hide and dodge enemies with. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the fight! Oh, I am so ready. That was it. Only one new enemy type and it was just a standard bloater zombie that took maybe 15 bullets to take down? Cool. Well, at least now you have the code to get to Lucas. But of course, it was just another trap and now you're in the same puzzle room as Clancy in the VHS tape. But wait, you already played through all this before just as Clancy. So, if you can remember the steps you took before, you can easily solve this puzzle within two minutes as long as you remember not to remove the wind-up key from the barrel of oil so you won't go up in flames when that cake explodes. And for some reason, I still find it funny that Ethan still decides to stand inches away from the cake after you light it with a candle even after he already witnessed it explode in the VHS. But I digress. At least the room is fine you're not gonna burn to death. Motherfucker! You're supposed to die! Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, don't panic. Let's turn this around and, uh, okay, nope, nope, there's no door there now. Okay, uh, let's just grab this and put it in here maybe? Ah, there we go. That was supposed to be for you, goddammit! After you've outsmarted Lucas, you're given access to the antidote ingredients and a nice little save room. And just beyond the door, Mia and Zoe are being held captive. How convenient. So now that you've rescued Mia and Zoe has crafted two antidotes, it seems that the day has been saved and you can finally go home. Okay. Seriously, what the f Yeah. Jack isn't dead, and he's back for another fight. But I have to admit, as much as I would rather be fighting a mutated Lucas at this point, this final, final Jack fight is actually pretty awesome, and it brings me back to a lot of the classic endgame RE fights. Once you shoot out all of Jack's eyes, he finally goes down once and for all. Ethan, this way. Oh, f you. All oh, right, the serum. I think we can all officially agree that Jack is finally dead. Jesus. But. Now we have a major problem. There's only one serum left and you need it for both Mia and Zoe to get cured of the infection. This is where Resident Evil 7 throws the biggest curveball I could have ever seen coming. They actually ask you who you want to save with the serum. <laughs> I'm not even joking. You get all the time in the world to actually choose 
between your own wife, who you went through all of this prior shit in the first place, or some random girl you literally just met for the first time in person only minutes ago. Bruh. Now here's a thing where I feel the plot had a major piece missing that would have made this decision a lot more impactful to the player. We were never truly given a reason to care about Mia. We know that she's Ethan's wife, but that's literally it. All we know of her is that she tried to kill us on multiple occasions, and she lied to us all this time about why she's been here in the first place. So, I will be honest that in my first playthrough of RE7, I actually chose Zoe over Mia, only because I didn't trust Mia anymore and I thought she was the reason behind this entire infection in the first place. And as it turns out, I wasn't actually too far from the truth in my original theory. Now, the game thankfully does have two different endings you can achieve depending on if you choose to save Mia or Zoe here, and for that I do like that they took the extra time to include an alternate ending instead of making the choice not really matter at all. But when I was recording the footage for this video, I decided to go with Mia because I do feel that is the more popular choice. I just wish the developers and writers would have given us more of a reason to root for Mia before this big moment in the story. Now Zoe is obviously pissed and she just tells you to leave her to die. So you both head off on the boat to get help. But then we come to the infamous boat section of the game. Alright, I'm going to kind of speed run through this part because you could honestly cut out this entire section from the game and I truly think it would have been an improvement. Sure. It would remove about maybe one to two hours of gameplay if it's your first run through, but the fact that the entire time you're on the boat it feels like a complete slog that just ruins the momentum of the story and the gameplay makes me feel cutting it all together would have just been the better choice. Either way, here we are and now that Ethan has been captured by the mold it's up to Mia to hopefully save him. Oh, side note, this exact situation happens regardless of if you choose to save Zoe or Mia with the serum. The only difference is at the end of the boat section, you will have to fight and kill Mia one final time as Ethan. But anyway, now you're playing as Mia, and essentially this entire boat is just here to help Mia remember how she fits into all of this, and how the mold got here in the first place. It all started out with Mia working for a crime syndicate called The Connections, and they were taking care of this little girl named Evelyn, who was a genetically modified human conceived as part of the next generation of bioweapons designed to eliminate enemies without the need of actual combat. Evelyn started releasing the mold onto the ship in order to escape and finally have a normal family of her own. She believed Mia to be her true birth mother, so that's why Mia was the sole survivor of the entire ship after a crash and washed up in the shores of Louisiana. That's when Evelyn found the Baker family and they took her in, thinking she was just a lost little girl, not knowing that they would eventually become infected by the mold and then eventually brainwashed into being her puppets. It's actually a really sad and quite deep story that just gets overshadowed by the weak gameplay elements throughout the entire boat section, at least in my opinion. I absolutely hate how in Mia's VHS tape you start out with a submachine gun and basically infinite ammo, C4 bombs, and health pickups. It's just way too easy, and it feels like a Call of Duty mission. To some players, this might actually be a fun section to let off some steam on countless waves of the molded, but to me, it's just a lazy attempt at bringing the action scenes from RE5 and 6 to this new generation, and it falls flat on its face. The one thing here that does not fall on its face is the actor who plays Jack Baker. I mean seriously, listen to this dude's performance. Ethan? Hey, shh, shh, shh. I know, I know, I know. I'm not gonna hurt you. Hell, I never would have if I could've helped you. What do you mean? I'm no killer, son. Neither is Marguerite, nor my boy Lucas, or even Zoe here. That girl, Evelyn, she did this. What the hell is she? Now, what did she do to you? She infected us with her gift. That's what she calls it. I found her near a busted out tank in the bayou. Everything changed after that. So she infects you and then she takes control? No. Not exactly, son. She just... She forces her way into your mind, your soul. You can't fight back. 
You are connected to her, and you can't resist the urge to. Oh, you're a, you're a different person after that. Just like Mia. So Mia sent me that message because of Evelyn. Listen, the, the girl just wants a family of her own. She's the key, all right? You find her and you stop her. Ethan, free my family, please. That man deserved an Oscar for that scene alone. Just great stuff. So now Ethan knows the truth and that Evelyn is the key to stopping this infection from spreading to the world. After Mia saves Ethan, she immediately locks him out of the room so that he can put a stop to Evelyn and so that she doesn't turn and try to kill him again. This is where you would have actually fought and killed Mia if you chose to save Joey previously. And then from this point on, it's once again another Call of Duty mission, where waves of molded enemies are in your way of reaching the house to find Evelyn, but for some reason there's over a billion dollars worth of ammunition and health items scattered throughout these underground tunnels to help you take out the molded freaks. How convenient. After we blast through all the molded, we finally reach the house where Evelyn starts to make you hallucinate in order to keep you away from her. This section is actually pretty neat and does help you see how Ethan is feeling internally after going through hell for this entire adventure. He even sees Mia try to attack him, but he realizes it's all an illusion and he must press on to put a stop to this monster. You finally find her in the attic, and once you get close enough, Ethan injects the serum right into Evelyn's neck, causing her to... well... you'll see. You. Why does everyone hate me? After you put pretty much all your rounds into her big ugly ass face, she throws you from the house and after Ethan somehow survives a 60 foot fall without breaking his spine, he's given a gun from the sky in order to finally put an end to all of this. With a good few shots of the head, she finally comes crashing down in a pile of broken mold. You did it! Yay! Who the fuck is that? So that was Resident Evil 7. I know throughout this video it sounded like I talked a lot of smack about this game, and truth be told, I actually enjoyed this game a lot compared to others in the series. I would even rank it above Resident Evil 3 and Resident Evil 5. I absolutely love the first few hours of this game where you're running from Mia until you get your hand chopped off so then you decide to fight back, even if it's your own wife you're trying to kill. And then of course, when you have to hide from Jack in the main house, God, it was just done so damn good. It's just a shame that the developers didn't spend more time on the enemy variety and the plot issues to turn this 7 out of 10 into a 10 out of 10. Also, why does the serum turn Jack and Evelyn into a pile of white mold when with Marguerite it only took bullets? And wouldn't the serum do the same thing to Mia or Zoe once they're infected? Those are just some silly thoughts I had, and I'm sure some Resident Evil diehards will explain them in the comments for me. If you do, you're awesome. But that's it for my retrospective look at Resident Evil 7, and I hope that you enjoyed it. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below on your experience with the game, and how my opinions lined up with yours, or if they deferred. This video took over a month to make, so please be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy this type of content, so that I know people do like my retrospective series, and I will continue to make more in the near future. Thank you all so much, and we'll hopefully see you next time. Peace out. Do I have your attention, boy? You're about to see someone. That's special. Hey guys, Nick here once again, and I just wanted to pop in at the very end of the video to give a special shout out to my channel members. 
If you don't know what a channel member is, essentially these wonderful people are using their hard earned money to help keep the channel alive. So that's why I want to give a huge shout out to these guys because they're amazing. And if you want to become a member yourself, you can do it as easily just by clicking on a little join button below every single one of my uploads or just by going to my channel. There is four different tiers depending on how much you would like to support each month and you can join for as little as $2 a month. And trust me, even if it's $2, it helps a ton and it adds up at the end of the month so that I can get more games for you guys to review or make retrospective videos on or to buy new technology such as new computer parts or really anything to keep the channel afloat and to make more content for you guys. So with that, thank you so much to Thrasher the Black Stallion. Vinny, Severman, Bacon Spaceman, and my lovely wife, Wade Lady. You guys are all amazing, and thank you so much for all the wonderful support. This channel is just growing and growing every single day, and I can't wait to see where this channel leads us. So with that, have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time. Peace.